Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the CWI Summer Conference, and I am very happy to be joined by Professor Jennifer Murray, and she is uh, with the Department of History from Oklahoma State University, and she has written a book that she, which I really enjoy, uh, which is called On a Great Battlefield, The Making Management Memory of the Gaysburg National Military Park, uh, 1933 to 2013. And uh, I like it because some people ask me about the World War One history of the field and the World War II history and ask me to come over and show them a couple sites. Yeah. So your book has really come in handy for that. And you're also working on a book on Mead uh, right now, correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, the Gettysburg book came out in 2014. And once I started getting a little bit of acclaim for that, I'm doing my first book signing here at CWI in 2014. And in fact, the very first book that I signed here at CWI, the guy says, uh, this is a great book, Jen. Uh, what are you working on next? I said, all right, like the ink is dry on my first <laughs> right. book. What am I working on next? Right. So that's right. I'm working on a biography of George Gordon Meade now, which will be um, comprehensive. It will be a complete biography, a life-to-death biography, which our field desperately needs. Right. Um, the last comprehensive Meade biography was done in the 1960s wow. in the Civil War Centennial. So it is time for Definitely. a new treatment of the victor of Gettysburg. Right, right. That's awesome. And and not to get off that subject, but today you spoke about the history of the battlefield as far as a public place to go to and all that, correct? Um, that's right. So my talk this morning was on the book, and mm -hmm. I encourage people anytime they're visiting Gettysburg to think about the layers of history. Of course, everyone comes for the battle and talk about the 72 hours of fighting, which is right. monumentally important. But to think about how the veterans coming back experienced the battlefield, what the men in the Army of the Potomac wanted Gettysburg mm -hmm. to mean, what they wanted it to be, men in the Army of Northern Virginia, the same. And then how Americans in the 20th century, which is really the focus of my book, um, associated to Gettysburg, how they remembered it, how they integrated it into their lives or their national consciousness, how it was used by the U.S. Army, like you mentioned, during World War II or World War One, And it's incredibly multifaceted landscape is incredibly interesting. Yeah. When did you come up with the idea to write the book? What, what was the spark? So I was a PhD candidate at Auburn and one of the classes you have to take as a PhD student is a research seminar and I did it over the summer because you needed you know weeks or months to write this mm -hmm. paper and I was working here at the park and I was curious about what I wanted to write on and I thought well let's talk about the transition from the War Department to the Park Service in 1933. So I did the research for that. I completed that particular component for the class, and I ended up writing um, basically what became the second chapter of my book. I got, as a graduate student, that chapter published in Civil War History, um, I think in 2009. And I thought, as I was working on it and talking to my dissertation director, I said, no one has done a study of the history of the Gettysburg battlefield. This is definitely a dissertation topic. Um, which it was, and it ended up being my first, my first book. That's cool, and, and it's really cool because we come here and we're just surrounded by obviously the seventy-two hours of the battle, and we we think about that through historical memory. But your book opened up eyes to new historical memory uh, facets that I hadn't even considered before. Yeah, and, and some of your listeners um, might be familiar with um, Timothy Smith. He's a professor at a branch campus, University of Tennessee, and Tim Smith has done great work on battlefield preservation too. He has good books on the history of Shiloh and he has a book called The Golden Age of Battlefield Preservation and he looks at the establishment of those five War Department parks, um, Gettysburg included. So his stuff is pretty cutting edge too and then mine goes right into the 150 some year history of the Gettysburg battlefield. Yeah, you were showcasing some photos in your presentation obviously downstairs and uh, it's amazing how much the landscape has changed because you showed a photo of, of like a there was a sign in a parking lot right near the Eternal Peace Light Memorial with seafood right. and beer yeah. and all that right on the battlefield. That's right. Those photos are amazing, um, and we lament, you know, the McDonald's or you know, whatever commercialization on Steinware Avenue today, mm -hmm. kind of grumble about it. But 
what the battlefield looked like in the 1940s and 50s is just saturated with commercialization. And that image that you're um, referring to is the peace light in with these little individual like cabins along the first day's battlefield and get your cocktail, get your beer (laughs) right on the right on the battlefield. Um, Stuckey's is probably a familiar Mm -hmm. chain to many of the Pennsylvanians around here. They had a station across from the peach orchard. You know, there's a Stuckey's in the peach orchard in the years after the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. That's just I can't fathom that. I mean, yeah. This is so amazing. You yeah. Know? And, and there was another photo you showed where it was a, uh, was it a gas station in front of uh, the Reynolds Monument That's in right. Buford? As yeah. Well, on, the, on that side of the yep. road. Route 30, of course, yeah. a major access into town is heavily commercialized. Um, that area. Um, but think about the double edged sword as Gettysburg gets over a million people, two million during the Civil War centennial. So you have to have these accommodations for them with mm-hmm. notoriety means gas stations. It's very different than Antietam. Um, Shiloh, you know, people listening to this have been to Shiloh. Shiloh's in the middle of nowhere, right? right? right um, it's right. very hard to get to, yeah. but it's immaculately preserved. It's very different than the Gettysburg experience. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's because of, of our historical memory at that time and popular culture? It's just when we think of civil, the Civil War, we automatically think of Gettysburg. And absolutely. And that's where you have to go. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that drives the economic Absolutely. Issues. And absolutely. I mean, look at the town of Gettysburg. Gettysburg's economy is tied intricately oh, yeah. to the National Park Service and this battlefield. Right. And it's kind of interesting because in the last 15, 20 years, I hear people who come here and they're like, there's no place for us to stay now because the hotels are, you know, some of them are gone or, or you know, the hotel rooms are filled up. Right. And we have to stay in Chambersburg. Right. We have to stay in Waynesboro. Right. And it's because some of those places are now right. gone. You remember the Home Sweet Home Hotel that yes. used to be on the fields of Pickett's Charge yes. that was torn down in the early 2000s. Um, you remember some of the controversy about the new museum moving to the location that it's out now. A lot of that was driven by the tourist shops on Steinor Avenue where people could walk from the old visitor center, the Cyclorama, across the streets, go eat, go shop on Steinor Avenue, and now it's not as accessible mm-hmm. to walk. Mm-hmm. from the new visitor center up to Steinway Avenue. Right. Yeah, and I often tell people, you know, that about the the third day's battle and the 8th Ohio coming out, and I'm like, they just came around pick, the Pickett's that's Buffet right. that's and right. just stuck yeah. there for a while, yeah. and people that's right. laugh, and I'm yeah. like, that's where it was. Yeah, <laughs> and that know? is right. That is yeah. right. But the hotel used to be there as well. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. Um, and what great changes. The power lines are all underground now. There's great photographs of what the power lines or the telephone lines look like going down Route 15, Steinware Avenue. Now they're all underground, you know, multi-million dollar project, but right. beautiful restoration success here at Gettysburg. Yes. It's incredible to watch. And you show, you showcase a picture of uh, U.S. Army men, uh, U.S. Army soldiers, I'm sorry, uh, doing uh, chemical warfare training out out on yep. the Pickett's Charge battlefield, and that was the one thing I noticed was the power lines yeah, that's back right. there. And that's it, right. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are checking out the soldiers, but then I'm, I'm looking at the power lines. Yeah. Like, wow, I remember yeah. it kind of looked like that. Yeah. Back in the day. Yeah, and I think that's neat. Many people have been to Gettysburg, obviously, way particularly here at this conference, more than once, and they have these memories of what the battlefield looked like in the '60s or '70s or '80s, and it's mm-hmm. it's changed with them. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's what makes Gettysburg special. Mm-hmm. Moving on to the next work, Mead. Uh, how did you get? Why did you get interested in, in Mead? Was it because there was a lack of a monograph since the '60s, or was it something else? Um, a little bit of both. Um, I was thinking about my second book project as the first one was coming to conclusion, and I had some ideas in my mind, but I wasn't really wedded to anything. And I was up here uh, with a group of college students from the school I was teaching at in Virginia, and we were talking about. Mead and we were talking about Lee and leadership and it just sort of hit me that weekend like there's not a good biography on on Mead and it was natural for me with my I worked for the Park Service for nine summers so that was sort of a natural extension my interest in Mead um, to do a biography on him and I've been working on that for a couple years and steadily writing now and hopefully it will be out by the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg in 2023. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, because I, I'm really looking forward to it because I, I'm a Pennsylvanian Mead fan okay. because of that. But also because growing up, we, we watched all the documentaries and everyone was talking about Grant Comes East and then Mead's pushed away. Yeah. It's like, you know, he, he becomes not even a secondary character. Absolutely. And that was really 
an interesting and sad thing. Absolutely. For, 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 for that. I think the movie Gettysburg, he gets this like super brief cameo <laughs> in right. the movie Gettysburg. He's not even mentioned in the Ken Burns series in any substantive way, um, which is all, you know, he meets overshadowed. He has this incredible rise to fame in three days in July mm-hmm. from a sort of obscure Fifth Corps commander to leading the Union Army to its greatest victory to date. And then the pursuit to Maryland at the Potomac River, everyone wants this decisive victory that he fails to destroy, completely destroy the Confederate Army. Lincoln is upset. Your greatest opportunity is gone. Right? Meade offers to resign. The northern media is frustrated with Meade. And then a couple months later, Grant comes east, and the whole conversation is changed. Mm-hmm. Meade's still in command of the Union Army, nominally. He still is command of the Union Army, but it really becomes Grant's men who win at Appomattox in the eyes of, of many people. Mm-hmm. In the eyes of many people, Meade gets pushed further and further aside. Right. Even to this day, it's it's Grant's army yeah. to, to a lot of people. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, many times I've been on the battlefield and people will be talking about Lee and, oh, this is Grant's great success here. Like, no, it's not. It's <laughs> Meade's great success here. Do you feel like the devil's advocate when you do that? When it's kind of like, well, you know, I have to burst your bubble right now. Right. It's Meade's army. And they're, and they're like, who? They, like, they've never. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was <laughs> a Gettysburg, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's tragic. Meade spent 40 years in the service to the federal government, you know, 40 years of his life mm-hmm. serving yeah. in the Union Army yeah, or U.S. Army. And I, we were just down at uh, Spotsylvania a few weeks back, and we were talking about Meade and Grant and the relationship between the two. Yep. And it's such a dynamic relationship in one way. In another way, it's kind of like uh, I almost saw it as like, you know, kind of a stepson kind of a thing where it's like, I'll, I'll deal with you, but, you know, it's... Yeah, that, it's kind of a weird de- relationship. That will be one of the interesting, complicated things to untangle with the 63, 64, 65 chapters is the idea that Meade is completely subservient to Grant. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not always the case. You'll see, hopefully my book will demonstrate this like a teaser for the book, but yeah, right. uh, Meade has a lot of initiative in the Overland campaign, much more than we give him credit for. Um, Will Green's new book on Petersburg that came out last year, that big you know, tomb of a book. Um, <laughs> right. Will Green sort of made that same case, too. I mean, we'll see Meade being a lot more active in the Overland campaign mm. than what is commonly perceived. So we, we're, we're still, uh, I guess you could say, victims of the popular culture of that time period, too, where Grant just takes, uh, he's in the newspapers. He's the one oh, who, yeah. who, who yeah. makes the... Yeah, and Meade does no favors for that. Meade has a horrible relationship with the press, the northern media. He's completely completely acerbic and very short-tempered with the media. Mm-hmm. He drums one of the newspaper correspondents out of camp, Edward Cropsey, um, who infamously reported negatively on Meade on the wilderness. And Meade sees this in the newspaper, and he's just irate. You know, mm-hmm. Meade's temper's kind of notoriously short. Right. And he brings the correspondent in. He puts them, um, he puts him on a, a mule backwards, and he puts a sign on him that says, Libler of the Press, and he wow. literally has this correspondent drummed out of camp, riding backwards on a mule, sign of disgrace, with all the soldiers in the Union Army watching this. And they're playing this, like, funeral sort of hymn music. <laughs> and there he goes. And there on after, the northern newspaper correspondents got together, and they said, we're not reporting on George Meade. Like, mm-hmm. you've suppressed. Like, think about how we look at the press today and mm-hmm. freedom of speech and media. You suppressed one of our correspondents. Anytime they have an opportunity to report negatively on Meade, they do it. Anytime there's success in the Union Army, it's all owed to Grant. Wow. He's kind of got a relationship like Sherman does. Then, yeah, Sherman's relationship with the press is horrible. Right, and yeah. it's kind of like Meade and Sherman yes. are on the same yes. parallel course. Yeah, and Grant doesn't like the press any better. He just tolerates them. Mm-hmm. He tolerates them, and he uses them to his advantage. Ambrose Burnside's relationship with the press is horrible. Burnside wants to have one of the correspondents executed. Like, there are plenty <laughs> Union wow. generals who have these really contentious relationships with the Northern press, but Meade, it really influences popular opinion. When you look mm-hmm. at the newspaper headlines of the Tribune or the Herald, and all you see is Grant, 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 mm-hmm. through 64 and 65, where's Meade? What's right. Meade doing? Right. He's being pushed further and further away from the American conversation or popular discourse. Mm-hmm. So how, how long have you been working on the Meade project so far? So a lot of research... Um, About three years researching and writing so far. Uh, Meade's papers are at the Historical Society in Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. um, voluminous accounts. So I've got through a lot of that research, and now I'm looking at Meade's soldiers or his subordinates. I want to know what they're saying about 
Meade. Um, so most recently, I was in Albany looking through Governor K. Warren's papers. You know, Warren's relationship with Meade really deteriorates after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so I want those accounts. I want to know what Meade's commanders are saying or what his soldiers are saying about him. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm. That's the ground I'm plowing through now. It, it sounds like it's going to be an awesome project, and it's like there seems to be an average, an industry average, as I say, of like seven to ten years for a major book. Yeah. To to utilize to make it and to write it and to do yeah. everything else, and a lot of uh, the younger historians who who watch uh, the podcast or listen to the podcast or watch the live streams don't realize how much work is involved in that. They think you can write a book every two oh. years, and it's like no, yeah. not not like that. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for saying that. I mean, think of all the archival places that you have to go to do your research. You know, that all costs money. It takes an incredible amount of time. Um, we teach during the school year, of course, with students right. and other demands. So it's it's a big undertaking. And then once you've submitted it, if you press, like University Press goes through a 18 to 24 month peer review process, that takes an extra year, year and a half mm-hmm. until it hits the shelves. Yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> it's, it's a, a long process. It's a long haul. Yeah, you're it's a dedicating long haul. a lot of your life to yep. that because of that time frame that yeah. you're doing it yeah it's amazing so you've you're now dedicating a lot of your life and your off time to george mead that's right so. i spent a lot of nights with george mead <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah. of weekends with george mead yeah, yeah. and i and i'm trying to to work on uh getting a, a live stream interview with you on the battlefield about mead in the future Let's, yeah we want to make that happen we, we have to make that happen we gotta make a couple calls yeah and make that happen chris quinn are yeah. you listening <laughs> looking at you chris quinn <laughs> So uh, I, I know he's probably watching right now, wondering, <laughs> wondering what we're going to be talking about about him. Uh, but no, I'm I'm so glad that you could you could come on and, and talk about the previous work you've done, but also talk about Meade because it's he to me is just so overshadowed by by Grant because of his relationship with the press, as you say. Yeah. Well, hopefully my book makes a small contribution and puts Meade where he belongs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope so. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will because, as you say. You're so passionate about the subject, but also it's been decades yeah. since a, a book like this has come out and yep. it needs to be done. Yep, there's an eager audience. Yeah, an eager I'm audience to learn about me. I'm one of them. <laughs> well, I appreciate I'm, you hearing saying that. So, so I I want to thank you for coming on the live stream, Jennifer. Yeah, it's, it's it been a pleasure. A lot to me, and it means a lot to my listeners and my followers to to understand what is out there as far as monographs are concerned and what people are working on. Great. And uh, I definitely would love for you all to to pick up. Uh, Jennifer's book that she came out with on the history of the battlefield because there's some great stuff in there and I'm looking forward to live stream interviewing you in a couple years when the Mead book comes out. Yep, let's make uh, it happen. Thank we'll you for having do me. It again, absolutely. And thank you all for watching this live stream. There's more interviews coming up.